Act One of the Princess Zubaroff by Ronald Furbank. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Adrian Schielmeyer. Read by Peter Yearsley. Eric Tressilian. Read by Chuck Williamson. Lord Orkish. Read by Nick Bulka. Mostignor Vanhove. Read by Alan Mapstone. Reggie Quintus. Read by Thomas Peter. Angelo. Read by Sandra. Nadine Schielmeyer. Read by Kay Hand. Enid Tressilian. Read by Abai. Lady Rock Tower. Read by Beth Thomas. Glida, her daughter. Read by Lian Ya. Marquesa Pitticonti. Read by Eva Davis. Dante Silio Paolo, her son. Read by Nemo. Mrs. Negris. Read by Kalinda. Mrs. Mangrove. Read by Vivian Weaver. Princess Zubaroff. Read by Sonia. Narration read by Todd. Act One. Scene One. Florence. Early summer. The garden of the Casa Mayor. Oleanders. Giant ilex. Judas trees. Flowering hibiscus. A few long green palms. In their blue shade, a peacock or two. A pillared circle of Bougainvillea wreathed arches supporting a hammock right through which a portion of the house can be seen. Within the circle, a faded marble statue, representing an effigy of the Virgin Mary, and a miscellaneous array of easy chairs, two or three, and a portable table holding magazines and books, extending down. A rustic arch left, leading to roadway. Distant prospect, Florence. Time, afternoon. Adrian. Eric. Where are they? Nadine and Enid have gone hunting together. Hunting? For antiques. Poking round for antiques. And we've been barely married a week. Adrian shrugs. <sighs> Our marriage is monkey. This little jaunt of ours ought to clear the air. Do you know, I believe Enid would be positively glad if I didn't return to her again. She seemed quite bright at lunch. Precisely. <laughs> Between ourselves, I begin to fear we've both made mistakes. I'm glad you can laugh. I can't help it. Thank goodness we shall start tomorrow without them. Yes, Nadine loathes the Engadine. Mountains depress her nature. Do all mountains? Anything she can't see over. Their rarefied atmosphere braces me. I'm never so well as in it. It can be had as well at home. Picking up a book, which he scans. She read romances night and day, and wished to live them after the fashion of the shepherds of Astria. She slept upon a sofa painted like grass, and in a room representing trees and sheepfolds, and when the beloved arrived, she would softly recite the eclogues of Fontenelle, would talk of tender flame as a sensitive heart, and dish up all the mawkishness of the operas. Princess Zubaroff has been lending me a moye some books. One's inclined to be diffident of her influence. Her heart's desire now, I'm told, is to make her peace with heaven. I know of nothing more dangerous, but I can scarcely believe it. One hears strange stories of her. Rumors, in fact. She fascinates Nadine and Enid, and here they are. Scene two. Same. Nadine Schielmeyer, loaded with bric-a-brac. Enid Tressilian. Both are ultra-beautifully dressed. Mrs. Schielmeyer's hat is one mass of quivering grasses. Don't bother. Enid, airily helping her. An imaginary footman helps. What have you been getting? Such enthralling things. Let's see. 
No, 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 no. Peevish? Oh, she's fagged, I fear, by our expedition. I'm not. We've been to Ishmael Levy. Ah, beware of fakes. He offered us a Lucia bearing her eyes upon a dish, a supposed original of Masaccio, and a fantastic moro like some strong perfume. He did? A head and hands business. Oh? And who should there enter as we were glancing around but Blanche? Blanche? Blanche Negress. Who's she? But so charming and so different to the rest. Then she must be refreshing. What induced you to ask her here this evening, Enid, by the way? Because I thought it might be fun. You know she writes things for the papers. What sort of things? Oh, don't ask me what sort of things. Nadine, throwing her purchases down upon a table. She was telling us at the Bretagne they charge her more to board her Great Dane than they do for her maid. Perhaps it eats more. Talking of eating, do you wish for a collation at daybreak before you start? No, thanks. You're packed? Not quite. Could I do anything? Oh, it's good of you, dear, but there's practically nothing to do. I suppose you're feeling pleasurably excited at the thoughts of tomorrow? Why not? Remember, won't you, Eric, to gather a little edelweiss if you should notice any? Yes, don't forget that. Though no accidents, mind. Naturally. Say out straight what you mean, can't you? What I mean? <sighs> I don't go in for arriere pensée. Oh, really, Eric, your hypersensitiveness would try an archangel, I think. Oh, would it? Poor child. Don't mind him. One knows his bow-wow ways. I'll not be long, dear. Kissing her fingertips to her. I've a very little letter I must write. Must you? Enid, moving towards house. Ah, oh, just a few hurried flying lines. Eric, following her. And I've some business, too. Scene 3. Adrian, Nadine. Their married voices. I could laugh when I think of her answering congratulatory letters still. She is having rather a pale sort of honeymoon, apparently. If she's neglected, whose fault is it? You surely don't think it's mine. I do. You dare to say that? Don't let's repeat Egypt. Adrian, shuddering. Not for the universe. He'd better look out. She's just in the mood for fireworks. Is she the deuce? I know Enid better than Eric. She and I were at school together. What possessed you? to ask her here for her honeymoon. Nadine, sentimentally staring at the tip of her shoe. Because, I don't know, I wish to lend her a little support, chaperone her, so to speak, the difficult first days. Poor darling, she had nobody. She was very unhappy at home. Eric and I, we too were at school together. Bah! Don't talk to me of Eric. He was my friend. What do I care? You tiresome woman. How dare you call me tiresome? Enid, returning. Excuse me, Nadine, but what is Charlotte's address? Coombe Court, Straithfield, say. And Elise? Five Rue Saganorel. Oh, thank you, dear. She goes in. I can't bear to see her look so bored. Bored? Poor little soul. It makes one weep to look at her. I never saw anyone so... Looking. What? Nothing. Nadine, putting up her sunshade. I believe you were going to insult her. I? I fancy you were about to say something unkind. Oh, that I leave to your Florentine friends. To whom do you refer? Adrian, lighting a cigarette. I refer to Lord Orkish. Ah. And to Mrs. De Wilson. Oh. And to Zena Zuboroff. Zena? But Zena adores Enid. Rot. She adores her. The garden gate opens, and the Princess Zuboroff, a very pale, vaguely sinister-looking woman, 
of about thirty-five, enters. She wears a riding habit, rather than Lou, fringed with sables. In lieu of a riding crop, she holds a fan. I just looked in to say good-bye. Scene four. Adrian, Nadine, Princess. What a charming surprise. We were this moment speaking of you, dear. Princess, coming forward. Of me? Oh, and what were you saying of me? I was telling Adrian how fond of Enid you seemed. How could one help loving her? Well, and what have you been doing? I'm just back from, oh, such a heavenly ride, halfway to Vallombrosa. But wasn't it grilling? We may expect a storm before morning, I think. Princess, drawing off her gloves. Rain is needed badly. It would do the young vines good. And the garden, too. Yours is a paradise. Those purple tragic roses. Tell me, how are they named? I forget. I love the flowers. They talk to me. I love the birds. They sing to me. What have they told you, if it's not indiscreet? They say that opera cloaks this spring are going to make one seven good feet across the shoulders. Ah! And that sandals shortly are coming in. What else? Princess, stooping. Let me admire your heliotropes. Your own garden, Princess, you know, is all our envy. <sighs> this year I'm very vain of my palm grenades. I don't wonder. My beloved garden, you should see it early, at break of day, when dawn makes its white holes through the trees. Perhaps tomorrow they will. And so you're really off? Yes. To those ridiculous mountains? Why do you say ridiculous? Aren't they? Not that I'm aware of. I am always disappointed with mountains. There are no mountains in the world as high as I could wish. No? They irritate me invariably. I should like to shake Switzerland. Looks at her hands. You have the perfectest hands, Zena. Have I? You know you have. How Angre admired my hands. He quite worshipped my little fingers. Scene 5. Same. Enid. Ugh, I can't write letters while Eric is fidgeting about. Wait till we're alone tomorrow. Yes, I think so. Oh, Zena. Goes to her. Princess, regarding her with pensive interest. You look done in, dear. Totally done in. Do I? Those great fatigued eyes. She does far too much. Last night she was chasing bats after midnight with a long white rosary. Have you seen yet all the inevitable sights? Oh, heavens, no. Beyond a few churches I've seen nothing whatever. Really? Imagine I haven't been at all to the Bargello. I was there one morning lately with one of the Hope girls. Oh! It was dreadful. She would scream at everything that attracted her and fall upon her knees and kiss and touch the things. I consider the eldest Miss Hopes a disgrace to England. You see her wool gathering about the streets, garbed in an old violet velvet sack, her hat set crooked, crammed with flowers. Yes, and Toshi too is aside. Toshi? Mr. Hope, the father of the English colony, you know. Of course. He's going to show me some time where one can get Venetian glass. Princess leaning on the back of a garden chair. I have passed through all the feds, I suppose, myself, in furniture and pictures and books. And now all I ask for is a cell. Give me a room with nothing in it. Mm, how horribly dull. It must need courage to be so eclectic. Not really. I often think I would rather like to run a convent. Oh, Zena! For little girls, not for sour old women. Have you remarked the cosmopolitanized faces of the nuns one meets hereabouts? No. It's so curious. Princess, 
beating the air dreamily with her fan florence i always say it's a place one drifts to in the end it's a pity perhaps so many what shall i say people do princess with a swift bright look i hear reggie quintus is in the town looking quite lawless reggie oh lady rocktower saw him one would like to be kind to the boy on account of his poor darling mother but it's a little difficult all the same he has the manners of one who has nothing to lose and perhaps something to gain perhaps he's so good-looking too good-looking for a man i don't intend ever having anything to do with him no well perhaps you're wise enid looking towards house why is eric beckoning i expect he wants his revenge at billiards go to him then won't you dear don't mind us i will exit adrian to house scene six princess nadine enid <sighs> this evening i feel so reckless so reckless i could wear a forehead ornament besides a hat princess fingering where did you get that love of a gown it was part of my corbeille my dear you have the instinct for dress i never saw anything so perfect oh is there anything the matter what have you done with your wedding ring i took it off what for i don't mean to wear one but my dear nonsense you must why i insist oh, of course if you're really keen where is it on the dressing table in my room i'll go and find it at once exit nadine to house scene seven princess enid princess a short silence he has not been cruel no you will make a fatal mistake dear enid if you allow him to go shall i remember the foreign colony here is a very hornet's nest i can't help it princess putting an arm about her how are you with him since lunch he and i are on tolerable terms again since lunch after all it's really rather risible i don't consider it risible in the very least not it's an unprecedented honeymoon even for florence oh, don't let's grow solemn in my opinion marriage was something altogether too excessive for such very light desires desires <sighs> smiles wanely both he and i are dead to any wish don't say so ah but i do what made you accept him then tell me it was purely a match of reason at home i was generally in the way mamma and i were nothing but rivals but let's not talk about it as a raw girl i had a disrelish for marriage too but my parents sensibly made me and when my first husband died why i soon remarried and when he poor fellow succumbed he was a world-renowned explorer i was induced to listen again slight pause and i've been married in all six times ah what a wonderful accumulation of experience you must have zina yes when i want to impress a stranger i carry their miniatures on my wrists three on each arm your last marriage was it happy my last marriage my dear was one long game of hide and seek i feel discouraged a husband one must remember is something of an acquired taste are they all alike why of course not aren't they princess nibbling her fan <laughs> no really you provoke me to laugh i've been married a week and it isn't at all what i thought it would be poor darling how i would love to spoil you you dear but you do not enough oh zina 
Princess, caressing admiringly her hair. Not nearly enough, Elflox. I'm all foolish nerves tonight. Poor angel, baby, waif. Enid, closing her eyes. What would you advise? Make the most of youth. Remember nothing lasts. You think I should take a lover? No, no, you'd regret it. There's no telling. Eventually, of course, you'll build a bridge. Impossible. Tfew. He's so altered. How? His tastes. They jar? <sighs> Dreadfully. His Hellenism once captivated me. But... Opening her eyes gloomily as wide as she is able. The attic to him means nothing now but servants' bedrooms. Servants what? Closets. Princess behind her fan. Oh. It's revolting. In life, to be happy, the first rule is to learn pretty extensively to ignore. I suppose, dearest, you were never situated before as I am. Princess nodding. Yes, indeed. One of my husbands also left me. Oh, Zina! Left me even sooner than yours. It isn't credible. He said a thousand tender pretty things, called me a thousand charming names, and then, at the end of twenty-four hours, he deserted me. What did you do? What could I do? If Eric deserts me, I dare say I could start an art school here. It would be rather fun. Darling Enid, anything rather than that. But why? Because... Scene 8. Same. Nadine. Nadine, flourishing wedding ring. Here it is. Oh, thank you, Nadine. Put it on. It's far too hot to wear a ring. Rubbish. For me, dearest, say you will. Very well, then. I will. Princess, over-brimming with quiet fun. How oh, she dreads a scandal. Nadine, her sensitive panic patently subsiding. Well, it's not quite pleasant, is it? And foreign servants are such fools. They'd think it was a faux menage or something. As if I care. Were I she, I'd allow myself, perhaps, a little sneer. I don't mean to upset my expression on Eric's account. But only a little tiny one. Enid, toying listlessly with her ring. Oh, don't ask me, please, to wear another thing more. Even a sneer. For his good one could wish he'd some interest. A man should have aspirations, I always contend. Ah, there, my dear, I'm with you. When I think that one of Caligula's horses was a member of Parliament, and when I remember what a plain, simple cow rose to be, I own I'm mortified at Eric's unambition. What did the plain, simple cow rise to be? She rose to be an empress. An empress? Or a goddess, was it? I'm sure I forget. A piano organ is heard suddenly beyond the garden gate. Horrid to be outdone by animals. Enid to dance air taking a few tripping steps. Well, my dears, it's been a week of wonders. What is that? Nadine, raising her voice a little because of the organ. She says it's been a week of wonders. Poor child. A week ago she was an insouciant girl. Insouciant. Princess, watching the bride with a mistrustful eye. I only hope she won't take to narcotics. We must not let her brood. The organ stops. One day soon, Enid, let us ride together. There's nothing I'd like more. Only I've nothing to ride, I'm afraid. I will find you a charming little horse. Enid, dropping to her knees upon the grass. What a darling you are. Princess, plying her fan. Galloping down some green cattle track in the cool of evening, child. You will soon forget your worries. Enid, nestling. Your habit smells of Arcady. 
of what arcady beyond the porta san gallo i often dismount and walk enchanting there's a road bordered by wild acacias i yearn to show you yes and at its end there's a calvary and a church designed by andrea ocagna with the loveliest windows one might perhaps do a sketch or something the green brightness of the glass is amazingly nice and such touching mosaics they are you'll see enter through arch left lady rock tower an uncommonly long and lean woman once a well-known beauty scene nine same lady rock tower lady rock tower hand extended advancing to nadine i wrote to you about a week ago asking you to dinner and having received no answer i thought i would ascertain nadine retaining lady rock tower's hand captive in her own an instant in token of contrition did i never answer both lord rock tower and i will be so disappointed if you fail us to-morrow night to-morrow night i fear we shall be without either adrian or eric are they leaving florence yes dear me i didn't know they're leaving us and italy i trust nothing serious nothing very that's right to enid my dear what a foreign behind i didn't recognize you at first how do you like my cinquecento jacket your fastidious imaginative dresses would not suit everyone fortunately lady rock tower looking about her where's glider i don't know she came a few yards with me and suddenly exclaimed oh bother and then rushed back your daughter i expect will be here directly lady rock tower shaking hands with princess very cordially dear princess although you live within a stone's throw one sees simply nothing of you yes how is it i wonder i don't remember ever having seen you at my musicale unfortunately but i hear it was quite wonderful with julie bonbon and emma block who told you mr waterbird i must protest he wasn't there oh i can't be civil to a political traitor my dear in politics there is no honor disraeli has said so anyway i should never invite the waterbirds i regard mrs waterbird as no acquisition i watched her in the mirror once acting a little pantomime behind my back nadine adjusting a pin they say she has three lovers three surely three lovers would be very inspiring how is it i'd like to know you're parting so soon with yours were i a new-made wife i'd hold my husband tight grip his coat-tails and not let go his going is of little consequence really it's soon to play penelope yet princess a shadow of recollection crossing her face were i driven to choose i'd prefer neglect i think to surfeit that i suppose depends upon the man <laughs> a husband's attention soon grows savourless enid her eyes raised towards the gallery he married me in creaking shoes what his shoes creaked when he married me i conclude you've been catching glimpses of each other glimpses i believe this is nothing but a touch of sex antagonism which presently will pass enid evidently pleased with the consequence of the situation this morning my maid found three little grey ones hairs darling enid she talks like an old woman and she's a mere finesse still were i you my dear i would go for him tooth and nail i always pour oil on troubled waters harmony for me three little grey ones she goes up stage enumerating them upon her fingers and disappears after a moment in the garden nadine following her with a look now she has gone off into some jewelled hades of her own i'm bewildered to know what to advise it's difficult to interfere enid and eric vying in vanity with each other as they do 
they're not sufficiently different one feels to be happy together enid's clever of course but she needs directing one comfort is there's no issue my dear give them time it's quite dreadful to hear her refer to her wedding day as black tuesday thank heaven marriage isn't indissoluble they're unreckonably temperamental both of them people of their sort oughtn't to marry last night she had a bad crease de nerfs and began calling sixteen the old age of youth princess fluttering her fan is she only sixteen nadine ignoring the interruption so this morning i sent her into town for dr matter i don't think much of dr martyr he'll tell you of all sorts of things to avoid things that in any case it would never occur to one to take what did he say he has ordered her milk and the wings of chickens enter glider rock tower aged eleven she is pale plump precocious an attaching manner scene ten same glider ah eccola a wicked peach glider standing legs apart and swinging insolently her skirts i met some people in the lane who guess i can't glida pirouetting preening herself apollo and lord orkish apollo who reggie quintus oh i told them you were here they're coming in enter lord orkish he is despite exile and certain age all cheerfulness gaiety and sweet good humour behind him reggie quintus incredibly young incredibly good-looking no one would suppose him to have figured as hero already in at least one cause celebre his manner which is somewhat subdued alternates between the demi-dazed and the demi-demure scene eleven same lord orkish reggie quintus do we intrude delighted We've just been paying our visite de digestion on Comtesse Willie White, and are on our way to salute at San Lorenzo. There's no immediacy, is there? Lord Orkish, shaking hands. Why, none. Perhaps you can inform me if Madame Gandarella is still at the villa? Yes, and Santuza. <laughs> that poor Santuza. She has the most fearful English accent in the world. Where is it? What is it? who could have taught her i wonder people are circulating such dreadful stories what about i am so newsy i feel i must tell it to somebody if only a lizard or a butterfly or a garden snail sit down and tell us instead all but imperceptibly a twilight begins to form i've but just this afternoon heard the alp murials are leaving one another Mrs. Atmuriel, in fact, is already gone. Gone? Where? Away. Dear me. Instead of surprising them, comment des he found them unmysteriously eating. Eating? Only imagine. And he with his drawn sword. Or revolver, was it? Oh. Lord Orkish, playing extinct eyes. Sir Dolphin Lewis is defending her. And what else, Lord Orkish, did you hear at the Villa White? That the new American ambassadress likes to be thought a little grisette. I sat next to her a short while ago at the Teatro Valli. You did not tell me you had been to Rome? Reggie, in a voice which is rather like cheap scent. Perhaps you won't agree, but I consider Florence as fewer amenities than Rome. It depends on what one means by amenities, quite. Reggie, regarding thoughtfully his white, compact hands. I always feel a sort of malaise in Florence. Why, I can't tell. I fear the morals of the town are not especially high. A neighbor of ours sent her little maid the other night across the piazza for a bottle of French brandy, and she has not been heard of again how dreadful enid coming down with a watering can of pissarro pottery in her hand she is smiling and has tucked into her dress a huge blue passion flower i heard men's voices 
lord orkish has been regaling us with a whole rosary of piquant anecdotes really nadine to lord orkish you such wonderful entrane men i'm never bored i enjoy everything so do i too i love society alone with my shadow i'm soon depressed and where have you been to reggie this perfect age reggie bending his head a little on one side to inhale the scent of the tuberose flowers that are in his buttonhole i and a friend of mine claude cloudley we've been visiting all the peas all the what pavia palma padua perugia pisa is it a method claude's such an extremist you know they say when he kissed the pope's slipper <clears throat> he went on to do considerably more what's he like reggie he's rather good-looking in a sickly sort of way what a description i expect he's very good-looking reggie smiling he's sickly i remember him coming to see me once in england with his dripping umbrella shall you be going to england princess later on princess cooling her cheeks with a powder puff perhaps if i can afford it to hear her speak she might be a poor clare our villa is let for the coming villegiatura to madame olga vitena gemot the famous singer and my husband is rampant with me because rinaldo renetti re-enter eric with billiard cue scene twelve same eric eric to enid shake me a cocktail darling do oh don't ask me to do anything so violent eric where is angelo nadine who looks as though she would be also glad of some refreshment herself what shall it be west coast manhattan kiss me quick uh, let it be a gloom razor there's no more absinthe i fear than a champagne cobbler will you excuse me exit nadine to house now i'm going to scold him no lady rocktower and princess zubaroff shall second me oh please i'm unrepresented she drifts away bonacera he begins balancing his billiard cue in the palm of his hand enid with an ironic glance follows princess towards hammock where lord orkish and reggie have commenced rocking glida he is the eternal masculine lady rocktower tout entière à sa parole attaché heartless man and so you're going to leave us for a time you propose of course returning oh, i expect so i think enid is a saint about it all for a honeymoon's a honeymoon however one looks at it bored people do desperate things why on earth did you marry eric ceasing juggling uh, i was only half serious when i proposed and she accepted you i never expected to be taken quite a pied de lettre. fool i beg your pardon i said insensate he continues his experiments with the cue come down to us a little more forsake those heights eric turning away if i leave you for a moment will you forgive me enid reapproaching lady rocktower please he seems determined let him go he has nice eyes there's something agreeably piquant almost about his excessive leanness perhaps so and i don't so much detest his big bold nose tell me dear were you solicited besides was i did anyone else ask you i should say so indeed i might have married whom i liked you seem to have selected an enigma enid playing with her passion flower i will say this for eric he isn't carnal he isn't carnal enough my dear from what i can see 
half to herself he must have the blood of an eskimo i scarcely realized i suppose at the time of my marriage i was taking him on for a term of years oh but it won't be years a term of weeks dear more like at the rate things go i think my nerves need mozart enter angelo a boy of sixteen fair sleek languishing a benzogazzoli bearing a tray with lemonade sorbets fruit etc he wears a trim black livery with violet colored facings and shoulder knots scene thirteen same angelo lady rocktower helping herself recklessly to strawberries i will order a novena said for you attracted by angelo and the tinkle of ice glida and reggie come down followed more leisurely by lord orkish and princess later nadine the twilight deepens lights here and there shine from town i believe strawberries are the clue to my heart are they i'm most awfully free on the fruit glida circling butterfly about i'm fond of grapes and apricots if they're green i can't say i like bananas fastidious child oh i adore them how much as a russian does a niece angelo backing him down towards footlights signora have you the key of your master's valise ah madonna answer me ah mamma mia enid taking a sorbet you haven't ah caro dio it doesn't matter ah che roba he crosses stage rolling his black eyes passing adrian left scene fourteen same adrian adrian to enid have you seen eric enid sipping her sorbet he was here a moment ago visitors he seems disconcerted at sight of reggie princess continuing her conversation with lord orkish i sent my new photo quarter face to the cardinal and he said enid drinking still you'll think of the edelweiss won't you if it's only a single sprig eh it would so touch nadine poor angel she's always wanting some rare far thing i know so be be a dear reggie deftly to lady rocktower without interrupting at all adrian and enid they had hoped it was diabolo but it's only sebastian ricci but it isn't the season for edelweiss nonsense i promise you you needn't try to put me off with an excuse lord orkish very deftly to princess lady audrey's still at Cannes. i hear you wouldn't know her she's grown so stout enid asserting her voice pathetically in general appeal isn't it the season for edelweiss for edelweiss i'm sure i don't know enid setting down her glass it is the season it is glida to princess what is the music written on your fan a gypsy song a chansonnette i will wager you what you like edelweiss grows all the year round nadine re-entering from house i think i hear the front doorbell it's amazing you hear anything enter angelo followed by blanche mrs negress he goes out looking over his shoulder apparently at reggie scene fifteen same blanche negress her hair worn short in wild spirals is tinged with white she is dressed in gray like a beguine she has a pannier of red lilies i walked along a pink footpath through the olive gardens till i saw a dog which nearly drove me back i don't know why it should be but italian dogs fly at me as a rule enid accepting pannier which blanche tends it's nice you're coming do you know everybody lady rocktower mrs negris lord orkish mr quintus princess zubaroff zina this is blanche delighted i expect it was my dog i left one at the door he moves up 
Nadine introducing. My husband. I think we've slept together once. I don't remember. At the opera, during Berenice. Why, of course. Nadine, glimpsing Eric. Mr. Tresillian. I gave you full permission to slay me. Why should she wish to slay you? Hark to his guilty conscience. Princess to Blanche. I confess with shame. I never read one of your books. It took me four years to choose my nom de guerre, Mary. <gasps> Are you Mary? I am. Oh, then, love's visé, I know. And lesbia, or would he understand? Her admiration is boundless. Enid, indicating books. By the way, Zena, I haven't thanked you properly. Were any of them interesting at all? I should think so. Cara. Enid, with a look at Eric. I'm glad I can still sometimes drug my senses with a book. I've been perusing Lord Tiredstock's memoirs. His biography is the barest memoranda, but it's wonderful. Reggie, at table where our princess's books, chuckles. What is amusing you? Arthur. What about it? It's too cruel. No. Reggie, reading. Woman is an object that always makes man ridiculous. Fiend! If she is ugly, oh, what a misery! If she is beautiful, oh, what a danger! And whether one takes her or leaves her, one always repents one's action. Well, really. Aren't you ashamed to read such things aloud to us? You said I might. Mercifully, very soon it will be too dark to read. Glida, indicating. Oh, do look at the sky! Extravagant, isn't it? Another airless night. I'm quite glad, you know, of my risorgimento cape. Puts wrap on. It is lightening a little towards the town. Florence fascinates me at sundown with its scores of shimmering lights. The evenings grow dark here so very beautifully. There's a sickle moon. Where? Show me. Can't you see it? There, through the trees. She turns to Blanche. I fear I'm becoming too obese to look at the moon. Then look, do, at the shadows instead. Blanche, staring. The shadows? Adrian sees shapes in everything. <laughs> he calls the trees at the foot of the garden an obscene brigade. My dear, if they choose to grow that way... Not the front stairs. It's as if a spell held all fast. Enid sniffing. Mmm, delicious. The fresh odour of the dew. My favourite tree is certainly the cypress. Glida, taking her fan from her and using it. Why? It tells no tales. But monotonous, like all evergreens are. Blanche, blinking at a flash of summer lightning. There was a beautiful thunderstorm the evening I arrived. At the Bretagne. Blanche, you would see. Yes, my room is on the river. Lord Orkish, returning. I don't know at all what the Arno is coming to. I was leaning on my window sill, <laughs> and there were some youths who appeared to be bathing without false modesty of any kind. Lady Rocktower, covering her eyes with an elaborately becoroneted vanity bag. How dreadful! I'm sure, if I looked, it was quite involuntary. I'm sure you couldn't help yourself from standing and looking. I love the Arno at low water. It's always that. Beyond the town, it's unnavigable for even a newspaper. Eric to Blanche. Ain't it was saying you write for one? I write for several. Oh? Which? Mainly women's. I was instrumental in a very large degree in obtaining my sex the vote. You are one of our champions, then? Yes. I'm glad you believe in us. Men amuse me sometimes, but I have never really loved one. 
you have never loved any man never lady rocktower nervously fastening a hook to her cape it's a pleasure to meet now and again a woman of really advanced morals i can safely say i prefer the society of other women to that of men that's nice of you lady rocktower to nadine well dear i really must run i wish i hadn't had to must you stay a little while it's absurdly early yet there's to be a small sauterie this evening at the harkovs we were asked but i didn't feel like going uh, i'm far too slack to go fagging up to fiesole tonight lady rocktower to glida come child good-bye you'll come and see me sometimes won't you lady rocktower moving towards garden gate with glida often if you wish it do lady rocktower upstage at a distance tomorrow let me see is there no charming church where we could go and sit scene sixteen same minus lady rocktower and glida lord orkish low to reggie and we ought to be toddling too reggie deaf to eric we might frivol round together one evening if you like i should love to only i've no leisure for anything just now princess observant to lord orkish in spain i'm told you must first court the husband to get round the wife lord orkish appalled at so much cynicism madam madam blanche to adrian designating something what is that big brick pile adrian looking where well, you surely don't mean the signoria and such a sad fateful sunset lord orkish touching reggie's arm ready reggie backing out of salute i'm so sorry but i clean forgot i've a rendezvous where at the quag end of the kissing which end's that the quag end the far end we can go part of the way together nadine coming down dear lady rock tower she gets statelier every year seeing lord orkish and reggie are preparing to depart what you're off it's getting late try to look in tomorrow reggie to princess bye-bye i press your hand does so i fear i'm engaged tomorrow tiresome creature lord orkish as he goes up accompanied by reggie i'm attending a tertulia chez camille well adio for the present Excellent. by garden gate lord orkish and reggie blanche precipitately making after them as they know the way i think i'll go with them exit blanche scene seventeen same minus lord orkish reggie blanche it must be almost dinner time i expect you're hungry after riding so far i am that's right this morning my french cook got locked by mistake in the orchid house and i've had nothing to eat all day nadine and enid coming down oh, stay, stay and, and dine, dine with, with us. us impossible because I must change. Look in after then. Yes, do, Zina. Perhaps I may peep in quite at the very end of the evening. We'll expect you. Princess, going. I'll bring a little volume of higher mysticism with me, shall I? That I think you'll adore. Enid, blowing her a kiss. How delightful. Till by and by. Exit, Princess scene eighteen adrian eric nadine enid adrian to eric shall we finish our game by all means are you going indoors Alphidasen, my deathless girl excellent adrian and eric scene nineteen nadine enid <sighs> why aren't the nightingales singing and why is there no moon but there is dearest a delicate new one all for us i mean a proper moon my dear enid focusing the moon with a black-rimmed eyeglass 
i see nothing improper about this one i meant a full moon darling i don't know why you should prefer it to be full a full moon is perhaps rather vulgar vulgar just a little angelo enters and takes away empty glasses murmuring intermittently to himself below his breath la poveretta la povera signora che roba dio he is almost crying in his distress for enid i suppose they leave early i've no idea i shan't come down neither will i i intend receiving his parting peck in bed eric never gives me such tangible proofs of his affection doesn't he in the morning he just touches my hand and then he just grazes it et encore again at night nadine after an instant pacing to and fro you know enid i consulted dr matter this morning after he'd seen you what about my health is in a very delicate state dear darling nadine yes i may be obliged but i won't tax your little ears with it just now enid anxious to ascertain the facts is it anything dreadful it depends what one means quite by dreadful define dreadful enid taking nadine's hand i'm so sorry nadine turning from her of course we may all be wrong i do sincerely hope so i must go and dress enid calling after her uh, tell ferguson dear as you're going in my gown with the camellias scene twenty enid sola she stands a moment lost in conjecture all the bells of florence ring out from the judas tree a nightingale utters a trill another replies all in an instant the air is full of the singing of birds the tintinnabulation of bells the sky is abloom with stars enid to herself aloud what can she be going to have moving towards a flower plat she inhales indolently a flower a gong goes within right hand to hip left raised to chevier she goes slowly up enid lifting roguishly towards the sky her face it sounds almost as though she were sickening for the plague the curtain falls End of Act One Act Two of The Princess Zuboroff by Ronald Furbank. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One same as act one only the trees have changed their tints some are orange some are scarlet red creepers autumn flowers nadine slightly overdressed in black with a colossal hat of piemontese cock's feathers is seen with a couple of lace pocket handkerchiefs tied to two fingers which she bobs and waggles diverting her infant son enid from hammock her gown is white with clusters of sophisticated-looking fruit hanging from it, is listlessly watching her. Enid, breaking at last the September silence, Why did you have it? Nadine, with a sigh, half of pride, half of resignation, My dear, I simply couldn't help myself. I thought you cleverer. Nadine, to the infant, Charles Augustus Frederick Humphrey Percy Sidney at any rate i'm glad the christening's over yes but it was beautiful and now this wretched party nadine kissing little charles he is just like an opening orchid enid sitting up she has in her hand a crystal just like what nadine rocking forgive a mother's selfishness i won't let him monopolize you nadine his mania for pulling everything to pieces makes me anxious for his happiness later on enid looking round here is mrs mangrove enter nurse she is scotch portly a woman of fifty 
one realizes immediately she would have her theories, her little ways, as regards nursery matters. Scene two. Same. Nurse. You shall take him, nurse. Very good, marm. Taking child. Gently mind. Nurse, bursting into song. The man in the moon drinks claret, eats powdered beef, turnip and curry, but a cup of old Malaga sock will fire the bush at his back. I hope you enjoyed the christening, nurse. To be sure. I seldom saw a bonnier. Nadine, privately, to nurse. See that he... He doesn't want to again, marm. Lord bless you. She bustles off through the trees with the child, nevertheless. Scene three. Nadine Enid. I am afraid she cannot have seen very distinguished service. In the last family she was in, on Notting Hill, she told me the governess and the five children used to go out roller skating through the London streets. Nadine, crossing over to her. Have you made any further discovery, Enid, in the crystal at all? It's difficult. I ought to have something to hold. Nadine, drawing something from her dress. Here is the last letter he wrote to me. Enid, taking it. Thanks. I feel it may be the last he ever wrote. Something tells me the other two that slipped. Nadine, closing her eyes, gesticulating. It's appalling to think of them both falling, sinking. Ch you may read what Adrian says. The walks. The walks are a continual delight. On all sides, turn where one will, beauty breaks on beauty. Nadine, euphoniously, with her lips. Beauty breaks on beauty. Wonder leaps on wonder. I think of you sometimes at Livorno, where the green waves roll in ceaselessly, and the brown fishing nets upon the beach lie drying in the sun. Because I told him we might be going to Livorno. A more depraved-looking autograph I've seldom seen. Now use the ball. Enid, after an instant. In the crystal I see a beautiful little giraffe. A giraffe? Such a darling. Oh, and I see a hut, a little house. She begins to squeal. That must be the guide's dwelling. Enid, still gazing. I think it's an antelope, not a giraffe. What is it doing? Enid, straining. Nothing. There, that's enough for the present. I want you fresh for the party. Enid, returning letter. It's a mistake, I think, having ordered tea indoors. It saves a lot of bother. Awkward if Monsignor van Hover should call here today. Nadine, flurried. Applying to her lips a cosmetic. Did Zena say he'd call? She said he might. I believe she intends taking it. What, the veil? I'm sure. But are you? And what's more, dear, she also intends us. <laughs> oh, I could never be a nun. Couldn't you? Could I? Enter Princess. Ah, here is Charlie's new godmother. Scene four, same. Princess. She wears something which is crocus-colored, contrasting radiantly with the autumnal foliage of the trees. A foppish hat, a winter-day muff. She is looking charmingly Carthaginian. Princess, coming forward. Charles Augustus Frederick. What are the others? Humphrey, Percy, Sidney. Princess, frowning, shocked. Such a wicked, dissolute name. Names. Share more. Well, Charlie's mother. Taking Nadine's hands. You're happy? You're content? Nadine, soulful, ethereal as before. It was beautiful. Was Violet de Wilson present? Princess, nodding. With a sort of starfish in her hair. Violet's changed. She has the look of a great sinner. Poor little woman. I want her so much. Nadine, dropping her eyes. You want her? What for? 
for my community oh zina i want you too us i mean to have you no princess giving enid a brush in the face with her muff oh yes i do enid changing the subject who else did you see at santa maria novella the harkovs the sharas the rock towers <laughs> even old mr hope who never goes anywhere i can't suffer countess harkov i'm afraid she thinks she has only to smile to stir up an ocean of passion it's a pity now she's getting to look so bloated you don't want her i hope i want everybody at least but have you found your sight i'm in communication with the vatican now so you are actually in touch princess nodding my prospectus i may say is practically approved by the holy father monsignor van hove would do anything for me where will you fix beyond settignano i think zina what it's too utterly uganda uganda far off nonsense what does one want to be near to i don't know what one wants to be near but i know that settignano is dreadfully ungettable one can't attain soul stillness dearest within earshot of trains and trams nadine catching her infant's howl no nor within earshot of my son and heir exit nadine hurriedly to house scene five enid princess enid hands to ears should i could i might i dare i drown it princess by hammock frankly smiling i almost wish you could how ungodmotherly zina of you princess seating herself the worst of it is the holy father may not consent to have a boy brought up among us among whom a little girl would have been easier to receive where in a religious house <laughs> a young man of charlie's age can go anywhere it might give the nuns thoughts thoughts princess toying with the tassels on her muff sexual ones oh but an infant all the same dear infants and a nun is such a sensitive creature as a rule i can't see that it matters at all it might do later of course some of us will be widows you dear for one <sighs> looking back how droll it seems looking back at what at everything this mystic side to you zina is it something new no your late husband did he know of it princess lifting her shoulders slightly he may have guessed only guessed racing pigeon shooting billiards and whist were his chief pleasures an egoist niels was different he knew who was niels he was my first oh i adored him we adored each other <sighs> he was the dearest of all my husbands tell me about him he was not strong he required always enormous precautions i presume you nursed him such a strange bored and beautiful face he had though harrowingly thin he was <laughs> i sometimes miss his clever imitations of farmyard noises yes he haw cock a doodle do he must leave a blank i remember he died just as the clock was striking midday enid speechless princess poignant eyed such a charming such a brilliant man he begged me to mourn him in chinese fashion white which of course you did and then when all the wreaths were spread demonstrating 
I danced a gavotte over his grave. He was not the explorer. Oh, no. What was he like? Poor Phil. I forget what it was I didn't like about him. His beard. Phil had no beard. Which was the one that had? You. He broke my heart. Enid, after an instant. Oh, isn't God far off? Zena, isn't he, dear? Princess, unruffled, abbasish. No, Enid, I don't think he is. Not very. Don't you? Princess, smiling. Certainly I don't. Enid, impulsive. Do you care to understand me better? Leaning against Princess. Well, I prefer St. John of the Cross to St. Vincent de Paul. So do I. Enid, a slight pause. Count six. I feel I don't want love, exactly, but some thrilling friendship. Princess, arch, gay, diagnosing. You want God, dear. God? That is what is lacking. Enid, as Nadine appears. If it only were that. Scene six. Same. Nadine. I found Angelo in the loggia, licking the ices. Oh, Nadine. Do you go to Donet or Giacosa? Giacosa. Enid, moving towards house. Oughtn't one to be going in? Nadine, following her. I suppose one should. Princess, dawdling. Delightful, the early dahlias. Nadine to Princess. Coming. Exeunt Enid and Nadine to house. Re-enter nurse from the right, bearing little Charles. Scene 7. Princess, nurse, infant. Princess, observing their names, admiring the dahlias. Louis-Philippe, Mrs. Marvel. Voluptuous Mrs. Marvel. Bending. Principessa Valentine di Odescalchi. A new variety, is it? It's been a glorious day, Your Highness, for your godson's christening. You made me jump. Nurse, holding up infant. He's a fine, vigorous boy, marm. Very. Oh, he's such a lusty little devil. He's handsome enough. Nurse. Tossing him. Oh, he's a sly one. Princess, shaking her muff at him. He never cried once as he was sprinkled. He never noticed. All the while he was being baptized, he was making turp's eyes at a couple of pigtails. Such a crowd at Santa Maria I've seldom seen. Poor Mrs. Scheidelmeyer. People are so sorry for her. It's terrible, I know. Begging your pardon, Marm, but do you think the master's really dead? I'm much afraid so. I don't, then. Ah? Uh? I'm just suspicious. The service I've seen. Well, all the papers. The papers? And the inquiries that were made. I shouldn't wonder now if he's not in America. In America? He and his friend. What makes you think that? Nurse, beaming. Gracious power. Darkly. I've seen what I've seen. Princess, raising a drooping dahlia upon its stick. Life? It's not for nothing I've gone about as I have. And you've no wish at all to settle down? It's all one to me. I seek a portress for a house of piety. That wouldn't suit me. It's an easy enough position. A porter's place in a sisterhood? You call it settling down? Think it over. Let all have their latchkeys, and maybe I will. Scene 8. Same. Reggie, hatless, from house. I want to hide. Hide? I hadn't thought it possible. To meet so many wicked people at a nursery tea. Who have you run away from? A withered lily woman. 
there are so many withered lily women vaguely here in florence reggie saluting charles please might i hold him nurse certainly sir reggie taking charles considering him he's such a profound-looking baby he has an ocean of sleep upon him oh he's a little rascal reggie to princess i'm told you called me disreputable the other night i'm sure i hardly recollect whether i called you reputable or disreputable i don't remember unkind and how are our actual prospects if i may little disappoint since at present i believe always in my own eventual star that's right i'm hoping to be a cardinal secretary soon are you nothing's quite decided but i think i've got the job you'll get awfully bored shan't you going to conversaciones in the religious world for sir until you assume your duties i presume you'll remain in florence reggie returning infant to nurse who parades slowly with it up and down lord orkish has asked me to make his house temporarily my home princess after an instant is lady orkish coming out this year she's been been she only broke her journey on her way from rome princess looking down while she speaks she didn't stay long long enough for lord orkish it made my flesh creep to see him in the white custody of a wife Shh, for shame i admire the old bean he wears his degradation brilliantly as though it were an order he talked across me at dinner once and i've not forgiven him for it it's awful i know when he begins about the cabal that rose up against me oh i'm terrified of him then reggie perceiving lord orkish and it appears here we have him enter lord orkish scene nine same lord orkish i've come as an emissary to say that tea is being served in the house i don't want tea thanks perhaps you'd care for an ice no why do you say no in such a voice never mind lady wilson phillipson has just arrived with an octet of daughters like cabbage roses so large so pink so fresh violins sound faintly from the house it's going to be a crush i think i'll go in as monsignor van hove may perhaps be in the drawing-room exit princess to house scene ten lord orkish reggie i missed you in the piazza mr hope offered me a lift up in his carriage lord orkish leering a little i wish people would offer me lifts i'd as soon have walked lord orkish dropping into a seat seen anything at all of his eminence not half an hour ago in furs and a soft tall hat like an oxford mist you didn't attack him me how could i his pretensions to youth are a little ridiculous reggie seating himself on the ground the first time i went to the vera i shall never forget i think the electric fan just kept me from fainting enter angelo with a salver and ices scene eleven same angelo lord orkish refusing ice no grazie there is something medieval to me in his appearance medieval reggie refusing ice it's his livery angelo smiling the signora will be said that you do not like her eyes what are they this lemon this pistachio and this ah chi lo sa should i regret it lord orkish to angelo fixing him were you ever in naples yes oh yes 
I seem to have seen you. Angelo, displaying his teeth, smiling. Via Tavolini. I dare say. As a boy I vend flowers. Via Tavolini? Now and then I would pose. Pose? Angelo, gazing indolently over his shoulder knots. I am a model. And so at last I behold a model footman. Ah, <sighs> caro Dio. The perfect servant? Angelo, smiling. Per bacco. You prefer this to Naples? No. Nice in Naples. I want to go to America. Why do you want to go to America? Chi lo sa? Young rapscallion. Angelo, rolling his eyes. New York. What should you do in New York? Yes. And what were you doing under the Piazza della Signora Colonnades the other night? Piazza della Signoria? An ambuscade. Niente. Niente? Ah, Gesù. Exit Angelo to house. Scene 12. Lord Orkish, Reggie. It's a pity he's lost his master. Adrian would, of course, have trained him. Where can he be, he and Eric? Nobody knows. Where the foxes say good night to each other, I should think. It must be a little triste for Mrs. Schumeyer. She seems perfectly resigned. Four or five small children emerge from house and scatter like butterflies behind the various bushes. Today she is receiving the felicitations of half Florence. Davvero! So many he's and she's I never saw. Enter the Marchesa Pitaconti, peering about as if looking for someone. Scene 13. Same. Marchesa Pitaconti. Marchesa calling. Dante! Dante Silvio Paolo! To Lord Orkish and Reggie, whimsically. He has left his mother, my little bundle of a boy. He can't be very far. A bambino, it seems, has captured his fancy. Peeping down among the dahlias. He is flirting something outrageously with the sweetest blonde. Yes? It is impossible to resist your English children. Lord Orkish, paternal, trying to look less like a wolf. Pretty attractive tots we italian women you know have an inclination an inclination particulier uh, for the english type ah the english type but not the english climate oh come it is not so bad as it is painted i have some charming recollections of your country of england salisbury on a summer morning delicious i remember i was delighted as well with bath one can hardly judge great britain from salisbury and bath or even stonehenge i don't i have been much further than that i have been in oxford and in cambridge and begins to gesticulate into the hebrides even yes i have seen the modern Athens, but no. With a grimace. Also, Abbotsford I was at. Ecstatic, cultured. Sir Walter Scott. Recollecting herself. But a Salisbury on a summer morning, Salisbury. She drifts away, peering for her son among the dahlias as Enid comes down. Scene 14. Same, Enid. Later, a little boy. Then Glida. The Marchesa is raving of the surpassing splendors of Salisbury. Salisbury on a summer morning. I suppose she's homesick. You know she was nay Smith and born in the clothes. I didn't. She is like a toy terrier that bit me. Shh! Don't say such dreadful things. Exactly. Enid, crossing the hammock, and lifting up forgotten crystal, which he proceeds with hierarchic care to wipe. They have a gorgeous place, near Verona, the Pitti Contis. 
which is mortgaged to the last sod. What? Gazing still? There's a new man now in the town. Oh, really? You must give me his address. He lives in the last house of a little mysterious street. You would never find the way. Have you seen anything yourself, Mrs. Tresillian? Enid, staring straight before her as though she were Cassandra. Today I saw a beautiful little giraffe. Queer. Or a goat, it may have been. I had a morning dream. I saw ghosts. Enid, uninterested. Changing the subject. In autumn, the garden is as melancholy as any churchyard. Oh, don't say so. Now is the time for Valambrosa. The forest must be beautiful now. Enter, from behind a tree, a child. Mother, where is she? I don't know, dear. I expect she's in the house. Exit, child. Wasn't that Violet's boy? Oh, no, he's four, and has the air of a budding policeman. Enter Glida, tres affaire, in a Botticelli frock. Aren't you going in for any refreshments? Thanks. Mother already had an ice. Glida, to Enid. The new American actress, Andalette, has offered to recite. Oh? The prayer of Akhnaton to the sun. She gave it only lately at the Harkovs. And I had to do it at the Via White. Oh, I cannot! I cannot! I think the sunlight has gone to her head. Reggie, taking Crystal from Enid. Let me see. Be careful. Reggie, consulting Crystal. A nigger! Lord Orkish, leaning over him. Only one? Lord Orkish and Reggie appear enthralled. Mama has had to go to a private exhibition, but she's coming on. Of what? Glida, seating herself. Of pictures. Oh. Portraits, all by women. Carriera, Kaufmann, Morozo, Lebrun. Fade, I should think. It's such fun, though, in Italy, being a woman. Why? I don't know, but it's such fun. <sighs> well, you're only a little girl yet. You should see the way I'm looked at. Where? Where? Oh, in the street, in church. The other day, in the railway carriage, coming back from Milan. Well? A young officer. Oh, how he stared. My goodness. The Italians, I find, are very easily impressed. Love's a dose of heaven. You modern girls are far too cute. Glida, after a hesitation. I cannot resist telling you. I've seen him again. Who? The officer. What is this craving after orange blossom? They would persuade us, it seems, a woman's chief aim is a march to the altar. He's deliciously dark. A regular raven, my dear. What next? Beautiful, tall and mysterious man. Oh. It was in the Cassine. He didn't speak? No. But as he came towards me, it was like a strain of music. Enter from house. Nadine, Princess, and Monsignor Van Hove. Scene 15. Same. Nadine, Princess, and Monsignor Van Hove. He is dressed in something subtly chic. He looks a lover of delicatessen. Monsignor to Nadine. Ah, Rome, Rome, in the days of Julia Farnese. I suppose it must have been. Princess, to Enid. Come here, dear, and be introduced. I want you to know each other. Nadine, to Lord Orkish and Reggie. They're dancing the Ferrandol. Quick and choose your partner. My dancing days are over. Quite. Nadine, taking him and Reggie upstage. I'll not believe it. Exeunt Lord Orkish and Reggie to house. Re-enter nurse and infant accompanied by a squadron of small children. She holds a story-book. Crossing the pillared circle, she seats herself sedately below the Virgin, with the children grouped about her. 
Glida shortly joins them. Scene 16. Enid, Princess, Monsignor van Hove, then Nadine. And so the Pope lends his authority. Monsignor twirling his thumbs. We have his prayers, his wishes. His prayers, his wishes. What could you want more, dearest? Princess, holding out her hand to her, the one with the muff. You, dear girl, and Nadine. She would never leave her child. Whoever doth not take up the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. My dear Monsignor. And isn't it so? I never wanted a child, I think, till now. <laughs> Will you not be such a cynic? My dear, I mean it. Peculiar devotion. And what is going on down in Rome? Few functions. It's full early yet. Monsignor, blinking. There was a ball the other evening at the Grand Hotel. Oh, whose? The Longfields. I hear she, Lady Longfield, is working havoc amongst the cardinals, with her copper hair, large moist eyes, and liquid voice. And she also subscribes to everything. It makes one feel so jealous. You are not forgotten. No. Cardinal Bentifiori very often speaks of you. He took me round Trastevere once. It stands out vividly in my mind, like a first infidelity. And Dom Yonkiel, too. I remember him, a great jaded-looking boy, almost as pale as the young man in St. Mark's who shows one the Palo d'Oro. I suppose, Zina, a long grey tangle of a veil? Where? I was thinking of our uniforms. All that, of course, is in my prospectus. Nadine, coming down. Monsieur Van Hove, is it true they intend to build a new embassy? The front quite windowless, the back all glass? Monsignor, blinking. It's the first I've heard of it. Nurse, serenely reading. Then the wicked witch smeared her little lambs with lamb's grease and twisted her round three times. In a trice the walls of the humble cottage fell away, and the palace appeared before them. Who told you, Nadine, about the embassy? Mr. Hope. What should Toji know? Nadine, looking round. I'm so nervous of him. Since his exile here, he has become a sort of public loofah. Nurse, continuing, on the crest of her tail. From that same minute the princess determined to follow the dictates of her heart, and refused to listen any longer to the worldly maxims of the king and queen. Ah, sweet innocence. Nadine, indicating a child. See that little gollywog there? She's the pontiff's niece. Oh. The pope is her uncle. She will become florid in time, like her mother. Princess, glancing toward the treetops. Hark to the birds. How happy they must be. Singing, singing, singing. Nearer to heaven than we are. Enter Blanche Negris. Scene 17. Same. Blanche. She is wearing a tailor-made red fern and a man's cravat. I've come to know if I may enroll myself. Eh? I happen to hear you're starting a sisterhood. Not too straight-laced, and I wish to offer myself as a probationer. Certainly, if you've any vocation at all. My work is over in the world, you see. I have nothing to fight for now. Are you even giving up your pen? No, but hotels and lodgings are such noisy places. I see. Noise, noise, noise. But are there no quiet rooms, back rooms, in back hotels, and in back places? I hate a silence that isn't real. Well, in the cypress alleys of our anchorage, 
I trust you will find inspiration. Enter Lady Rock Tower. I'm sure I shall. I feel it. Scene 18. Same. Lady Rock Tower. I was obliged to go to the P.V. of the women artists. Nadine, offering hand. I adore private views. This was so dull. Everybody is here. Some things are such an index. Violet is parting with her Rosalba. I wonder why. She's become so mercenary. She seems to have now a sort of hunger for money. Disgusting. I fancy she gives it. Oh. To a tall, dark man in the Pope's bodyguard. I suppose her lover? In my opinion, a woman may accept the consolations of Bacchus as soon as accept a lover. Do you really think she may? Still, every now and then one's face needs transforming. And love does it better than anything else. It depends, my child, upon the sort. I suppose when one's husband is fifty-seven. My dear, even a man of fifty-seven is better than nothing at all. I don't agree. No? I've been married, you know, too. Yet I sometimes think the simple comfort of a hot water bottle. <laughs> well, I'm going to speak to the Wilson Philipsons. I see Vicky over there. A few persons emerge from house as if to enjoy the scene, which begins to take on the aspect of sunset. I mean to be off-hand with her. She translates everyone into terms of color, and I hear she called me a dirty white. She's guapa, as they say in Spain. Poor things. They live. No one quite knows how. I passed them all the other evening in a covered bullock cart in the Viale dei Colli. Oh? I just moaned for joy, the big tears rolling. Enter Marquesa Peter Conte with her son Dante. He is sobbing. He has evidently been misbehaving himself. The Marquesa seems furious. Her English is perfect. Scene 19. Same. Plus Marquesa and Dante Silvio Paolo. <laughs> Did not your father give you the choice, wicked little boy? Pinching him. Of Oxford, Cambridge, Salamanca, Utrecht, Harvard, Glasgow, Edinburgh, or Heidelberg? <laughs> Lady Rocktower, turning. Are you thinking of sending him to school? Ah, <sighs> chère madame. Il est gentil, ce grand gosset. To Enid. Je trouve qu'il est en train de devenir chamon, n'est-ce pas? Marquesa to Blanche. Bonjour, cher ami. Blanche, all there. Come va? Bene, grazie le. Blanche, all there still. Benissimo. To what school? A che scuola shall you send him? I do not know. School? in my time was not the soft place it is to-day no as a young girl i used to be whipped with furs ah chère madame lady rocktower cheerfully rearranging the back of her dress i was all gorse marks often re-enter lord orkish scene twenty same plus lord orkish young astix is in a loggia is he people are making such a fuss absurd his slender volume of verses you could pass it under the door i dare say why aren't you dancing i'm too old or too lazy which at the fall florence tends to make one sluggish yes the autumn here is certainly enervating only this very morning i said to dr marta in the baboli gardens i have that tired feeling doctor again i said and i can't think what it can be oh lady rocktower he said to me with his piercing glance i assure you it's nothing but the change of season exactly 
I'll be glad, though, I confess, for Lord Rocktower's sake, when winter sets in. And how's my old pal Harry? We all thought him passing out a day or two ago. Dr. Martyr told me, but, oh, so sweetly, oh, so gently, he could do nothing more, when suddenly he sat up and asked for lobster soup. Lobster soup! There was none in the house, but within the hour the soup was made, and he was saved. Bravo! Every time I let the villa, he seems to quite give way. Ah! <sighs> Lord Rocktower loves Florence, and he loathes leaving it. I don't wonder. Marquesa to Dante, who is making grimaces at the Pope's niece. Ma che? Ma che? Enid to Dante. Come, and I will gather you a few dahlias. She takes Marquesa and Dante up stage toward the flower plot, while Nadine and Monsieur cross to pillared circle where Nurse is seated. Blanche, during progress of scene, has joined the little group which is watching sunset. I suppose if Mrs. Sheel Meyer withdraws from society, the next villa to let will be this. I've no patience at all with her if she does. The Princess Zuboroff can be very persuasive. It's all very fine for Zena, who is no longer in her springtime, to retire. Six husbands must have left her with the minimum of a heart. But for a young and pretty woman like Nadine Shalmire to give up the world, it's another matter. Mrs. Tresillian is sure to follow suit. Que de sottises! From sympathy. She trifles, she truffles, but I can't think she will. The princess is one of those who, when they cast their spell... I always stick up for Zina Zuboroff. I don't believe half I hear about her, although I dare say a good deal is true. They both laugh. It's a pity their husbands can't appear just to bring them to their bearing. The farandole is heard. Oh, they're coming out. Scene 21. General. Children, hand in hand, emerge from house. Making a ring, they proceed to dance about the garden temple. Youth, youth. Princess, approaching. I feel I want to dance. My dear Zina. I've had Austrian waltzes whirling through my head all day. Reggie is seen in the background pirouetting with Mr. Astix, the author, a wild young man who looks like the publisher's ruin. Oh, look at Reggie. Dear, dear boy. Monsignor, coming forward, benign. Everywhere delicious innocence. Princess, foxing, con amore, with her muff each little girl upon the ears as she goes by. None, none, none. The curtain falls. End of Act Two